Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Kevin Swain. I'm the student president of the William F. Buckley Jr. program here at Yale. Uh, before I introduce our guest, I'll just say a quick word about the program. Uh, the Buckley program is the only group at Yale committed to promoting intellectual diversity here on campus. We accomplish this goal in a number of ways, including lectures like today, uh, seminars, speaker series, firing line debates, uh, our annual conference, and a disinvitation dinner in the spring. Uh, we hope you'll visit our website at www.buckleyprogram.com to learn more or to apply to be a student fellow if you haven't yet done that already. Uh, now for our guest. Chairman Pai was designated chairman of the Federal Communications Commission by President Donald Trump in January of 2017. He had previously served as commissioner at the FCC, appointed by President Barack Obama and confirmed unanimously by the U.S. Senate in May 2012. Before his appointment to the FCC, Chairman Pai held positions with the Department of Justice, the United States Senate, the FCC's Office of General Counsel, and Verizon Communications. He grew up in Parsons, Kansas, and holds a Bachelor of Arts from Harvard and a JD from the University of Chicago Law School. Please join me in welcoming Chairman Ajit Pai. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, well, thanks so much, uh, Kevin, for the uh, very kind introduction. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, for coming. I have to say, though, that it is with a little bit of trepidation uh, that I'm here, and that's for a few different reasons. Uh, first of all, as he mentioned, I went to that inferior school uh, down the coast, and so uh, the last time I was here, in fact, was uh, during college. I was one of those college debate geeks, and it sort of brings back memories to be back here now. Uh, the second reason is uh, the person for whom the program is named, and William F. Buckley, just an incredibly august figure, a God and man in Yale, one of the sterling uh, books that has ever been written by an undergraduate. And by comparison, what some 25 years after I graduated from college, my career is essentially focused on making sure that anyone anywhere in America can play Fortnite. Not exactly the same level of accomplishment. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and the third reason is uh, that there are, in addition to obviously the best and brightest minds in the country, uh, there are here a couple of old friends of mine, uh, the Fosters, uh, Christine and David. Uh, David, of whom uh, is a special nemesis of mine since I'm playing him this weekend in fantasy football. So it is, uh, David, <laughs> division leading Foster Terminators, please go easy on my urban achievers. But, uh, uh, but in all seriousness, it is great to be here. I love uh, being on college campuses in part because it brings to my mind one of the best parts of my undergraduate experience, and perhaps yours as well, is the chance to learn what you don't know, interact with people uh, from across the political spectrum, and otherwise engage in an intellectual experience that uh, you might not, you likely will not get uh, once you start your professional careers. And that's one of the things I always uh, tell students that I speak with, is uh, to just embrace the opportunity. You're here at one of the greatest institutions in the world uh, to be able to learn. And I would certainly embrace, uh, urge you to embrace that opportunity. Uh, take classes well outside your a range of interest uh, just to be able to understand the nuances of linguistics or Chinese art or literature or whatever it might happen to be. Because I can tell you once you get to be uh, my age, uh, your focus becomes ever narrower and then next thing you know you're debating the nuances of 47 Code of Federal Regulations uh, <laughs> uh, to try to figure out better ways uh, to get spectrum out there or broadband infrastructure out there. Um, speaking of which, so I've been asked to speak for about 60 minutes on the history of telecom regulation, as I understand it. I thought I'd start with the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1882. It's a, no, I'm just kidding. I don't have any prepared remarks. So I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit briefly about what we are doing at the FCC. I'm sure you've heard about some of the bigger issues, net neutrality and whatnot. But uh, to me, anyway, the core of our mission, our number one priority, has been closing the digital divide, the, that gap between those Americans who have access to the internet and those who don't. And I've had a chance to see some of the successes and failures uh, in this area across the last several years. In fact, over the last two and a half years, I've been to all 48 states in the continental United States, as well as the territories of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And that's not just because I like to get out of Washington, but also because I think it's important for people in my position to see firsthand what people are struggling with when it comes to the lack of broadband access. And so I've been, for example, to Indian reservations across the country, from the Coeur d'Alene Reservation in Idaho, to the, Mission, uh, the Rosebud Sioux Reservation in Mission, South Dakota, to the Hemis Pueblo in New Mexico, and seen some of the challenges of the lack of broadband access in rural areas. Uh, on the other hand, I've seen some of the successes as well. In the last couple of weeks alone, I've been on connected farms that are using precision agriculture tools that rely on 4G LTE and Wi-Fi and GPS to be able to be much more productive. I met several people, including a man named Cullen Quill just last week in Horace, North Dakota, who's a farmer who told me that for the first time, thanks in part to FCC policies, in particular a grant uh, that will enable a small broadband provider that serves his town to provide gigabit infrastructure, 
uh, he is now going to get access to the internet. And when I asked him, what does this mean for you? He had somewhat of a blank look at first because he never had to have this problem. But when he thought about it, he said, well, you know, now we won't have to drive 30 minutes west to Bismarck so that my kids can go to the neighborhood McDonald's and rely on their Wi-Fi to upload their homework. I mean, to me, at least, that is the bread and butter of what we do, making sure that every American, regardless of who he or she is, regardless of who, where he or she happens to live, has access to what I call digital opportunity. And how do we deliver that from the FCC's perspective? Well, there are a couple different tools in the toolbox. One is modernizing our regulations, making it easier for all of the private sector companies, big, small, and in between, uh, to both enter this space and then to invest and innovate in infrastructure. Uh, so for example, among well, over the last couple of years, one of the things we've encouraged companies to do is stop focusing their investments on some of the fading copper infrastructure that's been in the ground, in some cases for 100 years, and focus on next generation fiber. Uh, make it easier for companies to build some of the wireless infrastructure that allows people to make a wireless call. And if you think about the fact that some 83% of 911 calls in the United States now were over wireless phones, it becomes increasingly important during emergencies for people to have access to that kind of technology. And also encouraging people to enter this space as well. Over the last two and a half years, for example, under my leadership, we've approved the first ever in this, uh, generation of non-geostationary satellite orbit constellations, or NGSOs. These are companies like SpaceX and OneWeb that over the next couple of months, actually, are going to start launching hundreds, if not thousands, of satellites in the low Earth orbit to provide internet access at a speed and at a price point that's going to be comparable to what you would get from a terrestrial provider. We want as many companies as possible using any technology whatsoever to enter this space because we recognize that time is not on the side of those who are digitally disconnected. Uh, that's, as I said, the first tool in the toolbox, modernizing our rules. The second one is updating the Universal Service Fund, the, essentially the subsidy program that we oversee. This is about $10 billion each year that we collect from any com customer a consumer with a phone bill. Uh, you might see on your bill a line item that says universal service fee, or your parents do if you're on your parents' plan, I should say. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that you'll notice is that fee, and that goes into a pot that is then distributed by the FCC. And so two of the basic reforms, uh, this is a very complicated program, but two of the very basic reforms we introduced in my first few months in office in this position was number one, uh, introducing the concept of a re reverse auction. Uh, for those of you armchair economists out there, uh, traditionally this program involved the FCC simply cutting a check to a rural telephone company and saying, you know, via con Dios, we hope you do the right thing with this funding, but there's no penalty if you don't. Whereas now we have much more upfront competition. So we invited cable companies and satellite companies, wireless companies, and even electric utilities to compete for that funding with the rural telephone companies. And as you might imagine, that kind of competition has a downward pressure on prices. To give you a sense of how successful it's been, last year, late last year, uh, we held what was called the Connect America Fund Phase Two auction. And we were designing uh, this program to address the uh, digital needs of six, 713,000 sm small homes and businesses. And we estimated it would cost about $5 billion to serve those. Those, uh, small home, those homes and small businesses. As a result of that reverse auction, we only ended up spending $1.5 billion. And so that $3.5 billion savings we can now pour into our next program, which is a $20 billion program we're going to be rolling out later this year called the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. Using that same reverse auction principle, we're hoping to distribute that funding in a very efficient way. And the second basic reform we introduced was targeting people who are unserved. Uh, we understand that there are some parts of the country where you might have slow internet, but in our view, slow internet is better than no internet at all. And so one of the things we've done is to redistribute funding to focus it on people who just have no connection whatsoever. And that might seem obvious to you at first, but when you think about it, and as you'll certainly see no matter what business you go into, uh, once someone has essentially a funding stream coming from the federal government, it becomes very hard to change course on some of those policies. We've done that nonetheless because we recognize that there are many places like Mission South Dakota that really need that digital infrastructure badly. And so as a result of these uh, universal service reforms, we're now getting millions more people connected to the internet, people like Cullen Quinn and Horace North Dakota and plenty others across the country. Uh, many other things on our uh, radar as well, 5G, as I'm sure you've heard, is uh, very much in the news, uh, both because of the work we're doing to get more spectrum into the marketplace and help America lead the world in 5G, but also because of some of the security questions that have been raised in particular by uh, companies that are based in China, and I'd be happy to talk about that at some length. And of course, some of the more popular issues that I'm sure you know about. If you put my name into Google, among other expletives, you'll probably find the issue of net neutrality, which uh, I'd be happy to discuss as well. But uh, I wanted to, I'm much more interested in the exchange with all of you. And uh, so I just thought I'd open it up to uh, uh, any questions uh, you might have and look forward to a very uh, robust conversation. Sure. If you have any, just raise your hand and I'll, uh, we'll pass the mic to you. Um, please make sure you wait for the microphone so that the recording can capture it. 
Yeah. All right. Hi, thank Hello. you so much for being here. My name is Megan Eiffel. Um, I was wondering how much interaction um, you have with sort of the hospital systems because yes. I'm hearing more and more about tele telemedicine. I sit on a couple of councils for a Yale New Haven hospital system and you were saying, you know, slow internet is better than no internet. What is sort of the timeline? Do you have a timeline yeah. to upgrade that? Because there's so many lives that are being saved um, having that option. Yeah, great question, and this is something that we've been very much focused on. Um, I'm the child of uh, doctors who practiced in a rural county hospital, and so this is also personal for me, not just professional. I still very vividly remember my dad, who was a urologist, waking up, and sometimes before dawn, driving 45 minutes west uh, to visit people who were in a town even smaller than ours, uh, where patients would literally never see a doctor, period, if they didn't have, to, if they didn't have the ability to drive. And so, uh, much to my chagrin, uh, you know, I couldn't go to medical school to placate my parents, but the least I could do now is to try to help boost telemedicine and telehealth across the country. And uh, just last week, as a matter of fact, I visited in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, then again in Abilene, Kansas, two healthcare systems that are interconnected with broadband. And the Abilene Hospital in Abilene, Kansas, relies on a hub in uh, Sioux Falls to be able to do some of this telemedicine. And it's incredible to see how they've decreased the incidence of sepsis by a huge amount of numbers, uh, also in emergencies as well. I mean, they can immediately get somebody on the line in Sioux Falls, an expert who can help them with emergency medicine. And even some specialties that you might not think are uh, susceptible to uh, telemedicine solutions. For example, mental health consultations. I mean, quite often, uh, that is one of the game changers for people who are struggling with suicidal ideation or other mental health problems. And to be able to get somebody, even if it's on a screen, immediately is really, really important. And so from our perspective, at least, in addition to some of the broader uh, broadband infrastructure policies we have, we have a dedicated program called the Rural Healthcare Program, which uh, for many years was a $400 million program established in the late 1990s to subsidize uh, healthcare providers' connectivity needs. Uh, two, a year and a half ago, I believe it was, uh, for the first time in the program's history, uh, I, pr I proposed and the FCC agreed to increase the budget by over 50%. And so, because we recognize that a lot of healthcare institutions really need that funding to be able to extend the expertise of their medical professionals. The other thing I uh, proposed recently was just trying to rethink the model of how we do telemedicine because the model of healthcare, as I'm sure you know, is changing. It's no longer the case that healthcare just, uh, services are distributed in a facility. The model is becoming inverted where care is provided where the patient is as opposed to where the hospital happens to be. And so to follow up on that promise, we set up a pilot program uh, the Connected Care Pilot Program that aims to subsidize the uh, connectivity of uh, wireless sensors and the like that would accompany patients wherever they happen to be. And so uh, I did an event in Atlanta earlier this year with uh, one of my childhood heroes, Dominique Wilkins. I just like dropping the name Dominique Wilkins. Um, so he's a, a diabetes patient, and he was talking about how wireless sensors enable him uh, to or enable his healthcare provider to monitor his blood sugar levels and the rest remotely so that they can intervene quicker in case they see that there's a problem developing. So before something becomes an emergency, before a patient has to take time off and go into the hospital, you could intervene quicker. And I think that is the future of healthcare where no matter where you happen to be, uh, you, you don't have to wait for a problem to materialize. Uh, the other aspect of it I would mention as well, it dovetails uh, with our work on schools. So we're trying to get all schools and libraries as well connected uh, using some of this funding. And this also has a telemedicine aspect. So uh, one case that uh, I wrote about with former chairman uh, Newt Minow, who was President Kennedy's first chairman, uh, I visited a school in Scottsville, Kentucky. Uh, Scottsville is a town in Allen County, which is one of the lower income counties in Kentucky. Uh, in, in the entire county of Allen, there's not a single pediatrician. And so if there are any parents out there, just imagine what you would do if your child got sick in school. You would have to take time off work, you would have to drive to the school, then you'd have to drive perhaps an hour west to Bowling Green or a couple hours south to Nashville in order to have your child seen. And that can make the difference between life and death in some cases. But now thanks to a broadband connection between all of the Scottsville schools and Vanderbilt a few hundred miles south, all a child has to do if he or she is sick is go to uh, the school nurse's office. And they've set up an app to allow patients to, uh, parents to remotely monitor their child's visitation. And so if parents don't have to take time off work. Kids can, be, can focus on learning. Teachers can focus on teaching. So those are the kinds of things we're trying to think about. And uh, I know there are many great applications for broadband, but to me at least, healthcare is one of 
it's the tip of the iceberg as the healthcare needs become more acute, as the access to care becomes more difficult, especially in rural and low income areas, we want to make sure that people like you are able to deliver that expert care quicker. Hmm. That's tremendous. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you've worked with the Veterans Affairs Department at all, but they have actually, yeah, they've got, in part because a law was passed last year that uh, essentially gets rid of the state-by-state -state licensing for medical professionals who serve VA facilities. Now they're able to provide healthcare anywhere in the country. And so we visited some, I've been to now five or six from Boise to Lacanto, Florida, where especially for mental health, some of the veterans who come back with PTSD, they almost prefer having somebody who's remote on a screen because they feel that there's more, uh, they can be more candid or more intimate. And so it's been a game changer for a lot of the veterans I've spoken with um, over some of these uh, telemedicine uh, pilots. Thank you. Hello. Uh, sorry, we'll wait for, wait for that. Oh, just for the folks who are watching, uh, you don't have to keep it clean. The FCC only regulates broadcast airwave and decency, so <laughs> feel free to let the expletives fly if you want. Sure. So, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. There are rules against uh, people uh, making unsolicited calls, oh, uh, and yeah. uh, uh, in particular, yeah. when you're on the do not call list, you're not supposed to get unsolicited calls. And I'm on the do not call list, but I get numerous unsolicited calls, and the problem is that the unsolicited calls come through spoof with spoof uh, IDs. Exactly. Uh, and therefore, they probably are in Pakistan or somewhere else, but I have no idea where they're from, and I'm not able to do anything to uh, stop them from calling me, and uh, I have certain people who call me every day, uh, and despite my requests, I can't get them to stop. So. Uh, I understand that your uh, agency has been looking into that, and can you tell us what you're doing on that? Yeah, this is something that drives me crazy. I get these all the time as well. Today alone, I can't tell you, I've, I think I've won about three uh, vacation homes from Marriott and uh, uh, a bunch of other calls in Chinese. I don't know why, maybe this is my last name. They go, oh, you must understand uh, but uh, no, it's not actually the case. So this is our top consumer protection priority. And so over the last couple of years, we've done a few things uh, to try to attack this problem. Number one, uh, we've cracked down on some of the robocallers themselves. The largest fines in the FCC's history we've imposed over the last two years on people who've been robocalling American consumers. Number two, we've empowered uh, the companies to start blocking some of these robocalls by default. Using advanced analytics, they can detect if a call is a spam call or not. And we've now made clear that we want them to start thinking about uh, how to block these calls before they even reach your phone. Uh, the next thing we've done is to set up a reassigned numbers database. So if it's a legitimate caller, like a local pharmacy or your child's school or whatever, uh, they can check this database to make sure that the phone number is actually assigned to you as opposed to another person. Uh, but the biggest initiative I'm really excited about over the next couple of months, uh, well, late, late last year, I should say, I demanded that the major phone companies adopt a new caller ID authentication framework known as Shake and Stir, uh, essentially a digital fingerprint for every single phone call. And if the phone call doesn't have that fingerprint, the phone carrier won't carry that call on its network. Some of the companies have announced that they've developed and implemented this framework and they're starting to exchange traffic only on the basis of that framework. And we're hopeful, and I told them by the end of this year, we expect them to implement it. Otherwise, the FCC will take action to make them do so. So we're making a lot of progress, and hopefully in uh, two and a half months, we'll get some good reports. Uh, but I understand that this is a great frustration. I mean, anybody with a phone now, I don't know about you, but whenever I feel it you know, ringing, I, I, I always look at it, and if it's not programmed in my phone, I just think, okay, well, here's another one of these. I'm not going to answer it. And uh, it's just, it's, it's an annoyance at best and a scam at worst. And uh, that's one of the things that drives me crazy. Oh, and you mentioned this as well. A lot, most of these calls come from abroad. And so thanks to a recent change in the law from Congress, uh, we are now, uh, we've made formally illegal some of the calls coming in from overseas. And I've additionally signed a memorandum of understanding with uh, India, Brazil, some other countries where we see a lot of these calls coming in from so that we can share information. Uh, and then they share it with their law enforcement to be able to crack down on some of the call centers that uh, are, are generating some of these calls. So I, I know it's a great frustration and uh, my own mother-in-law complains about it all the time. And so if only to save my seat at the Thanksgiving Day table, I've got to be able to show some progress on that front. So our incentives are aligned, I guess you might say. Great news. And, yeah.
Thank you. Um, so it seems like the repealing of net neutrality's internal logic was about improper government regulation of the marketplace. But over the past year, year and a half, there was, there's been a lot more energy, even in the Republican Party, to regulate tech companies. Mm -hmm. Has, have you seen any sort of shift in headwind or any new kind of priorities in Washington, and has that affected how you do your job? It doesn't directly because the FCC under current law doesn't have uh, jurisdiction to regulate some of these tech companies. Uh, we don't uh, regulate how twi Twitter organizes uh, Twitter moments. We don't dictate how Facebook organizes newsfeed or how Google uh, orders searches, uh, search results and the like. Uh, but one of the things I did point out in a speech I gave in November of 2017 is that I think, I think the American polity would be much better off if there were transparency across the entire internet economy. And this is, mind you, about two years ago, so well before the current uh, heated debate started up. But I said, look, if these companies were more transparent about how the algorithms are used to order what it is we see and what we don't see, I think a lot of the debate uh, would, uh, over net neutrality in, in particular, but just generally speaking, uh, would be much more informed. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, and now we're at the point where you see Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill, on the presidential campaign trail, and elsewhere saying things that just a couple of years ago would have been unthinkable. I mean, just a few years ago, I think everyone, or most many people, uh, thought of some of these Silicon Valley tech giants as the sterling examples of innovation uh, in the American digital economy. And now, many people, including even around the world, I mean, France, uh, for example, is considering a digital services tax expressly for the purpose of slowing down some of the American tech companies. And so that conversation has changed quite a bit. I continue to maintain that uh, transparency is very important for everybody, whether you operate a network or run a company that su supplies content over that network. Um, it's unclear how it's going to change. I know some folks on, uh, on Capitol Hill are talking about legislation. You see some folks talking about breaking up tech giants. Uh, fortunately, for better or worse, uh, we are somewhat insulated uh, from that debate. And so I don't really take a position on it other than monitoring it with uh, some fascination, uh, you know, being an antitrust lawyer in a previous life, and then also having seen how the debate has changed over the last two years. It's, it's been really remarkable. And I'd be curious how people in your generation seen it, since you're, you're arguably the first uh, purely digital natives that this country has ever seen. You've grown up with the technology, and so it's probably even more inextricably intertwined with your life than it is uh, with mine. Hi, uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the FCC's role in U.S.-China relations, including yeah. regulating uh, companies that play a role in communication like Huawei. This is a great question. I've been spending a ton of time on this recently, uh, especially as the U.S. starts to emerge into a 5G environment, 5G being the fifth generation of wireless connectivity. Uh, there's been a lot of questions about, well, how, how do we... Uh, regulate the equipment and services that go into these 5G networks. And that's in part because of the way these networks will be managed. Uh, 5G will look very different from 4G and predecessor technologies. Instead of uh, big cell towers intermittently dotting the landscape, we'll see a lot of small cells densely packed in, all monitored using software. These are going to be uh, software-defined networks, or SDNs as they're called. And that software is going to be installed and updated over time using millions of lines of code that could be generated anywhere. And so, as they call it, the, uh, the attack vector uh, for those who mean us ill is going to be much broader than it ever has been. And so in addition to doing all the work on spectrum and infrastructure to get 5G into the United States uh, as quickly as possible, we're also doing a lot of, we, I personally am doing a lot of work on the security side as well. Um, part of that involves a supply chain proceeding. So about a year and a half ago, we were the first agency to propose barring the use of federal funding we oversee, that $10 billion program I talked about, the USF, we, barred the use of, we proposed to bar the use of any of that funding from being spent by uh, recipients on equipment or services that come from companies that are determined to present a national security threat. Uh, following that, the president issued an executive order essentially broadening the scope of that proposal. Uh, and so right now we're trying to figure out the way forward on that. Um, it is a, it, it's a really big challenge, I have to say, uh, because on one hand you have a company like the one you mentioned that is based in China that is exceptionally cheap compared to some of the other competitors. And speaking of the competitors, there aren't that many anymore. There are no US-based competitors uh, as such. It's basically Huawei, Samsung, Ericsson, and Nokia. In addition, those latter three companies are not subsidized by their government. Huawei is, typically. And so what I'll hear from many governments, I just did a swing through the Middle Eastern countries, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, et cetera, and what they told me is, look, Ajit, it's all very well and good for you to suggest that a non-Chinese supplier is the way to go. On the other hand, if I have equipment that's comparable, if not better, and it's 50 to 80% cheaper, 
how do you how do we make the economics work? And so that has been a real challenge. Nonetheless, though, we've been trying to educate some of our allies about how we see things, not to dictate to them what they should do, but just to say, look, from our perspective at least, it is problematic that China has a national intelligence law that part of which requires any company subject to its jurisdiction to comply with a request for surveillance from its intelligence services. Moreover, another part of that law prohibits any recipient of such a request from disclosing it to any surveilled party. And so you can imagine, uh, think about parts of the Midwest where we have military installations. If you had a wireless network there that could be um, operated and managed remotely using software, you can imagine the Chinese intelligence services might take an interest in you know, what, mis what military installations are there, what personnel go in and out, are there any, is there any weaponry that we should know about? I mean, those are the kinds of things that are pretty sensitive. And that's the easy case. The harder cases are going to be things like our electrical grid. You can imagine in 10 to 20 or 30 years when our grid is operated using some of these next generation networks, along with the artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other tools that ride on top of those networks. Uh, you can imagine that it would be an easy thing for a foreign uh, rival to say, okay, let's knock out their grid in New Haven, you know, just to see <laughs> if we can disrupt things. I mean, that's the kind of uh, thing that we're worried about. So uh, I don't have any easy answers on this front, except to say that we're working with some of our partners across the federal government. Uh, we work all the time with the DHS, with the State Department, Department of Defense, the National Security Agency, everybody in the intelligence community. We're pretty unified on this, uh, and also with folks on Capitol Hill, Democrats and Republicans and the like, uh, in my experience at least, have been uh, very uh, worried about the threat and willing to help us uh, solve it. Oh, and if you don't mind saying who you are, where you're from, it's just kind of nice to put a more context to, uh, to okay. the name. Uh, hey there, uh, I'm Jacob from uh, Minnesota. And All right. I guess I just wanted to get you to, to dig into the whole sort of broadband as a utility mm -hmm. issue, because I guess in, in my sort of personal experience, it doesn't seem like the market is very competitive. You yeah. know, e even sort of here, right, you know, it's just this is a Comcast place. And right. quite recently, you know, there was a new fiber provider that moved in, which pushed the prices down, suggesting that there's exactly. was and still probably is rents on the table. So I'm, I'm just sort of curious to see your approach because yeah. it's sort of you know, moved away from sort of the utility model w towards a more sort of competitive model. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, yeah. if there's still rents, what's going on? Right, exactly. So that's a great question. So uh, to me at least, broadband is increasingly important to virtually everything we do, from telemedicine to education, precision agriculture to gaming, you name it. So it's incredibly important to almost every aspect of American life. However, that does not to me at least suggest that it should be subject to utility style regulation. And that's because if you think about it, Everything, think about every utility that you operate with on a daily basis. The electric company that supplies the power here, the water company that delivers water to the water fountains outside this room. None of them are particularly innovative to me. They're essentially regulated monopolies. And to me, the better solution is to introduce competition into that marketplace. And one of the reasons why, I haven't looked up New Haven specifically, but I would suspect that one of the reasons why you haven't seen competition as much thus far is because traditionally what happened was that the local franchise authority, essentially the city government, would do a deal with the cable and company and say, okay, we will grant you essentially an exclusive monopoly to serve this town as long as you provide laptops to the school or you support our public uh, educational or governmental channel. And so there was a deal between the city government and a particular broadband provider. To me, so one of the things we've tried to do is to break down those barriers. One of the reasons why I suspect that fiber entrant just entered was a new policy we introduced called One Touch Make Ready. So think about it, if you're a, a competitive fiber provider and you want to enter to provide competition to Comcast or whoever it is who's the incumbent, uh, traditionally you would have to get access to utility poles to string your fiber. The problem is that there's an electric company that already uses that pole, the power line. There's also typically a cable company that uses that pole for the cable line. So to get your fiber installed on that pole, you would have to get permission from the electric utility and the cable company, and they would have to do the work to move their infrastructure. They would have no strong incentive to do that. So last year, we introduced a policy called One Touch Make Ready. Essentially, that competitive fiber provider can do the work itself to move that infrastructure. And we've also made it cheaper for them to gain access to the pole in the first place. They don't have to pay exorbitant fees anymore, uh, thousands of dollars or whatever it is for, to the city government. And so as a result of that, we're seeing more competitive fiber providers enter the space. And to me, that is ultimately the better long-term solution, in addition to encouraging companies like SpaceX and some of these fixed wireless companies to enter. Uh, to me, at least, competition is a much better way to guarantee consumer welfare at the end of the day 
than a slow moving utility. I mean, part of the reason why I was a little bit late coming here is because we came on Amtrak and it was 30 minutes late. If you want your internet to move as efficiently as Amtrak, to be as popular as your post office, to be as you know, successful as your DMV, then utility style regulation is the way to go. But otherwise, I think at least the market is a much better way to ensure. Sure. The, the, we, I'm sure we do somewhere in the, the recesses of our office. I could have, you know, certainly get it to you. I don't have it at the top of my mind. But we have seen many more companies entering this space. And in particular, you know, electric utilities, like I mentioned, uh, some of the satellite companies now launching uh, and providing service, and fixed wireless companies in particular. Uh, I don't know if they operate in New Haven, but I know they operate in Boston and New York. There's a company called Starry, for example, that uses some of the spectrum we've made available in the 37 gigahertz band. And they offer, I believe it's symmetric 250 to gigabit service uh, with very, very low latency, very responsive service, at a pretty appealing price point. And they're, they're now taking share from some of the cable and telephone incumbents. That's thanks in part to our policies. And so, uh, like I said, you could, I would definitely encourage you to uh, take a look at uh, some of the things that we're doing along that front to encourage more competition, because that's one way to make sure that you have more choice at a better price. Hey. Hi, uh, my name is Alex. I grew up as part of a military family, not really from anywhere. Uh, you, man of the world, in, indeed, uh, <laughs> of, of the of the waterways of the United States. Uh, you and I have some pretty uh, sort of fundamental uh, political differences, and I'm sure those. I'm shocked. And I'm I, college campuses; those are my core constituencies. <laughs> like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm sure uh, those, uh, this might not be the medium to resolve them, but what I do want to say is on an apolitical basis, your Twitter game is just so strong. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Thank you so much. And this great. is a pitch for you to follow me back. But um, So uh, what's your handle? Uh, it's uh, A McGrath 626 We can work it out afterwards. But um, You're uh, the one. Ah. <laughs> I think I muted you in 2017. No, I'm totally kidding. A McGrath, okay, I'll give you a follow. Uh, my question basically is about Twitter as a medium and yeah. you as a public servant using it. What, uh, what are your thoughts on its efficacies? What are your thoughts on how it doesn't work? And maybe if you can compare yourself to the president's use of Twitter, just what are your, what are your thoughts on Twitter I mean, as a public servant? That's, his Twitter account is more like the Ferrari. Mine is like the Chevy Traverse with the <laughs> hubcap missing by comparison, I think. But uh, um, no, so that's a great question. And thanks, uh, thanks for noticing the feed. I sometimes, it drives my wife crazy whenever she sees the glow of my phone at night. It's like, you're on Twitter, aren't you? Just put that thing away. It's like, it's, but I find it, it's a fascinating, uh, much more than any social media platform that I've ever dealt with. It's just a fascinating, Fascinating platform. So I was the first FCC commissioner on Twitter uh, back in May of 2012. And when I joined, my fellow commissioners said, you are insane. I mean, rule number one of the interwebs, don't interact with the, or feed with the trolls. And to my, in my experience, at least, it's been a great way both to get the message out about what we're doing. I mean, anyone in the country, anyone in the world can see, for better or worse, uh, what it is or what I'm doing uh, by following that Twitter feed. Uh, and part of it is also just to learn from people uh, who I find interesting. And so I follow a lot of reporters who cover stuff well beyond telecom. I and mean, one of my favorite follows is uh, Harun Marouf, who is a reporter who covers East Africa. And so if, if there's something happening in Somalia or Mozambique or Ethiopia or Eritrea, I'll know about it because of his Twitter feed. And it's you know, not material to my job, but I just find it interesting as somebody who has a curiosity about the world to have this platform where you can learn anything from anybody. I mean, uh, a number one, Simon, uh, I don't know if you follow Simon Kustenmacher, but his whole thing is about maps. He loves maps. And so he'll post all these great things about interactive maps. And I just like following people like him. And you know, I also have a celebrity streak in me. I like following some of the celebrities. And just to see, you know, oh my gosh, you know, Adele is uh, dating Skepta now. This is a big deal. So you know, just to be able to follow that. And then uh, also people following you back. You never know who's going to, like celebrities, athletes, and whatnot. And so Dominique and I actually met on Twitter. I tweeted out something uh, for those of you out there who for, have forgotten about the human highlight film. I just remember this is him. And he immediately saw it. He, he DM'd me. And next thing you know, we started talking on the phone. And then it led to a conversation about telehealth. And a couple months later, I'm down in Atlanta doing this event. Uh, same thing with Sean Payton, the coach of the Saints. Uh, he just started following me. And uh, I, you know, I love the NFL. As you probably can tell, I would have made it in the NFL had I not focused, <laughs> had I not focused on communications regulation. It's like a, uh, someday the first they see wide receiver. It's going to happen. So um, anyway, so uh, we, we just one thing led to another, and uh, I got in touch with him. 
And I said, hey, I know you guys are playing the Titans on Sunday night. I'm going to be in New Orleans. I'm sure you're busy, but I'd love to stop by. And he DM'd me back. I was like, yeah, sure, come on, and, come on by. And so there he were on the practice facility. And he was explaining how they put these chips in wide receivers, shoulder pads to monitor their breaks with uh, precision and uh, yeah, just getting to see Drew Brees' locker and all this kind of stuff. It's really kind of neat. So, uh, But to me, the best aspect of it is uh, the fact that there, I, I learned things in our space, in the FCC space, that I didn't otherwise know. And to give you one quick example, and you probably have seen this on my feed if you follow me, uh, but back in December of 2013, a woman named Carrie Hunt uh, took her three kids to meet her estranged husband in a hotel room in Marshall, Texas. And as soon as she got there, the husband started stabbing her. Uh, her nine-year-old daughter, who was with her, ran to the hotel room's phone and started dialing 911. But the call didn't go through, so she tried again, and then again, and then again a fourth time. And the call never went through because, unbeknownst to her, you had to dial a nine first to gain access to an outside line, an access code. And so uh, two weeks after that, uh, somebody tweeted the story at me who was a friend of uh, the father of Carrie, uh, and he said, you should really take a look at this. And I took a look and I thought, that can't, uh, it just made me wonder how prevalent is this problem? And so two weeks after that, I got Hank, uh, the father of Carrie, on the phone. A month after that, I sent a letter to the CEOs of the top 10 hotel chains in the United States. A year after that, I stood next to Hank in Marshall, where we talked about some of the progress we'd made in getting hotel rooms to get rid of, the, hotel chains to get rid of this nine or eight access code. And then last year, I stood next to him in the Oval Office when legislation named after his daughter, passed unanimously by both houses of Congress, was signed by the president making this law. And I played a small part in that. I wasn't the straw that stirred the drink. But I do find a great deal of gratification in knowing that thanks to this digital platform, I got to meet Hank and understand about the issue and contribute to positive change that any of you, whenever you check in a hotel room, you won't have to encounter the fear and terror that Brianna had hunted when she tried to save her mom with a 911 call. So to me, at least, it's a pretty good platform, even though it gets a lot of flack. And then just to fulfill, satiate my uh, partisan bent, do you stand by that video that you made uh, with the six <laughs> reasons uh, for net neutrality? Uh, I veer between yeah and hell yeah. <laughs> I mean. For, for, for all the flack it got, go through each one of those. It was seven things you can still do. How many of those are true? Can you still post on Instagram? Do you have to pay $5 per tweet? All of the stuff I said, it, it was just a fun, light way of doing, uh, explaining the issue. And I understand that people who hate my guts or hate the policy or whatever would take aim at it. But at the end of the day, look, our goal is to explain in whatever way we can, uh, to people who might not be as familiar with the nuances of Title I versus Title II regulation, what does this mean for me? And so the video is just a kind of a lighthearted way that was proposed as, at the end of an interview, an actual interview, which is, hey, would you mind coming in and you know, doing a lighthearted video? I'm like, oh, sure, okay, why not? Well, what's the worst that could happen? And uh, you know, uh, so, uh, but I think at the end of the day, uh, our, our goal was to tell the story about what this would mean um, in, in a positive way. And I'm happy to say now, after the decision, I mean, the, the results have been really positive. From December 2017 until December 2018, average speeds in the United States were up 40% year over year. We saw a $3 billion CapEx increase in 2018, the second consecutive increase. Millions more ac Americans getting access to the internet for the first time, including that guy I talked about in North Dakota. So in a nutshell, at least, more people than ever before, faster than ever before, are able to hate tweet their favorite FCC chairman, which I think at the end of the day is a positive. I will take that as a trade-off. Thank you. Hi there. I'm hey. Michael. I'm from Connecticut. Uh, as someone who hmm. is in a government agency with a lot of power in everyone's daily lives, how do you see how do you see your role as uh, oftentimes governments criticize for being behind on the times and their regulations following the yeah. spread of technology and especially with communications where there's always this constant oh tech change. How do you see the FCC as leveraging, what are the best ways it leverages its power to make intelligent regulations and stay up as fast as it can for those technological changes. Yeah, part of the reason why I was sighing is it is a huge challenge. I mean, especially now when technology is changing across so many different vectors so quickly. And it's not just the nuts and bolts of communications networks. I mean, we need, now need to understand how does artificial intelligence and machine learning change how networks are going to operate uh, or 
you know, how telemedicine is going to progress and things like that. We need to understand what is the potential of things like blockchain, for example, uh, to be able to change how we allocate spectrum. Uh, could it be done on a decentralized basis as opposed to the FCC essentially monitoring and licensing out spectrum as we traditionally have done? All these technologies are emerging. Uh, you know, quantum is another one that's uh, on the horizon. So one of the great things about this job is we have the ability to call up people and I certainly have no, uh, I, I have a sense of humility about this stuff. I recognize there's a ton of stuff I don't know. So I love calling up people and saying, hey, can you just come and explain what it is uh, that this technology is? How does it work? How could it affect what we do? Uh, so we've done that with blockchain. I was just at Coinbase a couple of months ago and just sitting down with them and having them show me under the hood, uh, this is how decentralized ledgers work and uh, or distributed ledgers work and this is how blockchain could impact what it is you do. Uh, we had the first ever forum on artificial intelligence and machine learning back in December, where we brought in experts from the academy and from industry to talk about how they see AI uh, affecting things. And it's just a, it's a constant stream. I always feel like I'm behind. There's some new innovation that, or potential innovation that I need to learn about. And that's part of the reason why I'm on Twitter as well, to be honest, is that there are a lot of smart people out there posting about what they're working on and what they see. And, uh, it's uh, very much like you probably feel too. It, at least when I was in college, there was always this sword of Damocles hold, hanging over my head. Another paper I should be reading, or a book I should, be, or a paper I should be writing, paper uh, I should be studying and whatnot. And um, now it's just the same. I, in addition to the day job, we've got to keep up on all this stuff. And I have somewhat limited bandwidth at 46 years old, so to speak. So. Oh, I will say, by the way, I should mention, so one of the things uh, to make sure we were on the cutting edge, uh, we traditionally, when I came into office, had an honors attorneys program. So we brought in some of the bright new uh, lawyers who had just graduated from law school, men and women who wanted to come to the FCC to start their careers. But we didn't have anything comparable for engineers, in, in part to make sure that we had people who were interested in those next generation technologies. Uh, we recently we set up an honors engineering program so that uh, even if we're not aware of what those technologies could be or how it could affect our work, we can bring in some of the best and brightest to help educate us about what they are and uh, how we can do our job better. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, hi, I'm Caroline from St. Louis. I was wondering... Oh, not a Cardinals fan, I hope. Yeah. I am a Cardinals oh, fan. My God. <laughs> 1985 is all I can say. Great World Series. I'm wondering what steps has the FCC or other government organizations taken to prevent countries like China from hacking into U.S. companies and stealing intellectual property like the F-35 with Lockheed Martin? It's a huge issue. Uh, so that is the, primarily the purview of the Department of Homeland Security. DHS has an agency called the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. Uh, CISA is headed by a person, uh, Chris Krebs, who I work with quite a bit on all of these issues. Um, especially some of the intellectual property and theft. So uh, there is both overt, and I guess you might say uh, implicit uh, threats here. So what the overt one is when you know, they hack in and they just steal technology, or in our space, uh, Cisco, for example, uh, they essentially took a bunch of Cisco routers many years ago, reverse engineered them and rebranded them as Huawei. In some cases, the, the manuals, the operating manuals still had Cisco listed in them. In some cases, the Cisco sticker was still available, uh, visible on the router. So that's the kind of thing that we try to guard against. But there's a more, there are also some very implicit threats too that we're not quite sure how to handle. So for example, um, if China subsidizes uh, 5G research on college campuses, university campuses, and then retains rights to the intellectual property that's generated by some of those academics. Is there a national security concern about that? I mean, I would argue yes, in many cases, because they're developing technologies for a specific purpose, and essentially it's American researchers who are doing the legwork. So that's one of the things we're trying to think through is how do we, uh, even if it's not technically hacked, how should we think about some of these other dimensions of the threat? And uh, it's it's exceedingly complex. I mean, the U.S. for many years have obviously has had a very open, free market approach to this stuff. Research has traditionally not known international boundaries. And now we're reaching the point where if you have a very determined adversary, uh, how do you address some of those threats? And there, too, I don't have any easy answers. And the hot corner in the back. Hey. Hey, Chairman. Uh, my name is Billy. I'm from New Jersey. You can just call me Ajit, by the way. There's no title necessary <laughs> here. So. Um, I have two questions. The first being, how do you think the um, recent federal appear appeals court ruling about the net neutrality repeal yeah. kind of changes the FCC's approach to the whole issue, especially in terms of states and yeah. what powers they have? 
Uh, and the second is something during the proceedings, which I'm sure you know, went viral, was your Reese's mug. <laughs> yeah, uh, <I> know. <laughs> can you kind of give us the origins? I did not bring the mug with me, <laughs> in case you were wondering. But yeah. What what kind of the uh, the origins behind that mug are? And uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we'll start with the first one, since that's uh, the more work oriented one, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the decision overall, as I said, was a pretty strong affirmation. Uh, you had a panel of a uh, very diverse panel, two Obama appointed judges, one Reagan appointed judge, who agreed on the core things that we did, uh, the reclassification of broadband as an information service, et cetera. The one area where they disagreed was on uh, state uh, regulation. So to me, at least, I think the court got it wrong on that point. The majority got it wrong. And the reason is that the internet is inherently an interstate service. I mean, even though we're in the same room, if you email me or tweet me or whatever, the chances are that, that communication traverses a state boundary. And so it seems obvious to me that regardless of what administration is in power, uh, only the federal government, only the FCC can set policy, regulatory policy for that infrastructure and service. And so I think ultimately, um, that's one of the questions we're gonna evaluate is whether to seek further review, uh, either from the Supreme Court or the full appeals court on that point. But I think uh, broadly speaking, the co this court still uh, made available uh, the ability of the FCC to challenge particular state laws, uh, either legislation that's passed or executive orders that might conflict with the federal policy. And I would simply say that when the shoe's on the other foot, uh, if a Democrat is in charge of the FCC in the future, and you have states, uh, primarily Republican states, that are regulating in conflict with the federal government, I can assure you that my successor will want to make sure that that federal policy is not subject to a patchwork, depending on the state that you happen to be in. I think. At the end of the day, po politics aside, I understand the politics of this issue, we, have, we are rapidly reaching the point where we need to have a consistent national policy on things like communications, especially when we're in competition with countries like China, which for <laughs> obvious reasons don't observe the democratic niceties we do. We, for com our companies to be able to innovate and invest, whether you're a content provider, uh, application developer, or network operator, you need to know what the rules are of the road. And so um, we'll see how things progress on that front. Uh, but it, that was uh, an interesting wrinkle that uh, we hadn't anticipated. Uh, with respect to the mug, so uh, many, many years ago, uh, my wife and I, or then girlfriend and I, were up in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and we visited the Hershey Museum. And uh, I saw this mug sitting there, and I love coffee, and I love Reese's peanut butter cups. And I, like, this is, I mean, you know, but I don't know. This is the best. It doesn't get any better than this. This thing is giant. And uh, so then we would, uh, when I was a commissioner, I, when later I became a commissioner, uh, by law we're required every month to have these meetings in the FCC's official meeting room. And sometimes these meetings would go on for a while. And you know I'm a pretty fidgety guy, and I just need the coffee. It's uh, you know, not that I'm addicted, but uh, uh, sort of. But anyway, so I would just sit there and I'd start sipping the coffee in this mug. And um, and then uh, in 2017, I guess it was John Oliver did that skit on me and he made fun of the mug, and I'm like, man, now it's on, all right? It's like, you make fun of me all you want, don't attack, the mug was collateral damage, like, it's, you know, why, why take on the mug? But it's amazing how many emails and tweets I get, still to this day, who are like, screw you and your mug. It's like, <laughs> like there's an extra little oomph on the mug, you know, just like taking it out of the mug, or, or conversely, a lot of people will ask me, uh, I did, uh, when I mentioned North Dakota, I was visiting a farm out there and was talking to this farmer about precision ag and how the combine works and all that. And then after our, our uh, conversation was over, as we were walking back to our truck, he said, hey, did you bring that mug? And like, even like, everyone has heard about this thing for some reason. So uh, anyway, one of the earlier videos I did before the infamous one uh, was kind of trying to one up Oliver. I got an even bigger mug, if you probably saw that. And uh, that was a, yeah, so we went to Home Depot, got a garbage can, sawed it in half. Uh, emblazoned uh, Reese's on it, and then uh, yeah, it's somewhere it's still floating around the office, I suppose. But uh, but no, it's amazing how often now I just get these inquiries about the mug. It's uh, it's something else. I would I'd be curious to know whether actually in Hershey somewhere there's like like a PowerPoint presentation like talking about the positives and negatives of being associated. Yeah, you know, the because there's been a lot of brand recognition, right? I mean, you know, like everyone knows Reese's at least better than they did before. On the other hand, it's a you know, controversial government figure. Is that a positive plus or minus? I don't know, but uh, anyway. Hi, I'm Joyce. Hi. I'm from New Hampshire. Um, and I may be one of the few people in this room old enough to remember the um, geomagnetic storms of 1989. Oh, yeah. The uh, solar flares that knocked out. I don't know if this is in your bailiwick. Mm. Um, 
another word that you have to be, have been around in 1989 to know, probably. Hey, I took uh, the SAT. <laughs> but I'm you like, do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm curious, <laughs> I mean, it, from my layperson's vantage point, this, yeah. in, a, in a world that has become so totally internet uh, dependent, this, it, uh, another such flair, which we're due for, is a, an international disaster. What kinds of preparations does the FCC make? So we don't have jurisdiction over those issues. It is something that we monitor. Uh, uh -huh. you know, there have been a number of these uh, over the years. Uh, there was, I can't remember the name of it. There was one in the 19th century that essentially knocked out. And of course, the con But this would be the first time we'd had exactly. the internet. Ex yeah, so that's one of the things we do uh, worry about. Uh, it's more the purview of, again, DHS and some of the other I agencies see. that mm -hmm. have jurisdiction over those issues. One thing we do have jurisdiction is kind of related to that is uh, orbital debris. Uh, so with all these satellites up in space, many of which supply mission-critical service, GPS, for example, a single, uh, for those of you who saw the movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock, even a centimeter wide a piece of orbital debris can essentially knock out an entire satellite system. And so one of the things we're thinking about now is how to update, refresh our orbital debris rules to make sure that if something bad happens, uh, you know, there's a, a asteroid or a meteor or just a, a, a wayward satellite that breaks apart, uh, we don't end up in a situation where all of that infrastructure in space is destroyed. But um, so that's a serious concern, as well as uh, EMPs, electromagnetic pulses, and the like that are deliberately uh, detonated here on the ground. Uh, but for better or worse, that's the, the purview of other. And if I might just ask a follow up question sure. Does um, similarly do the increasing uh, events of that I will say look as if they're caused by climate change? Yeah. Um, uh, have an impact on what you do in your work and, and preparation for the kinds of increasingly frequent large-scale disasters? Not yeah, we spend a lot of time on hurricane, uh, and, well, just generally speaking, uh, disaster uh, rest recovery and restoration. Uh, so I've personally been to Puerto Rico twice in the wake of Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Irma. I spent a lot of time in Virgin Islands and Texas and Florida and other places that have been hit by some of these hurricanes. And we spent time working on wildfires in Colorado and California. Because one of the things that we've learned and I've urged FEMA and other agencies to think about is the fact that comms networks are one of the most critical pieces of recovery and restoration. I mean, food, water, obviously that is critical for life. But one of the things I've noticed uh, when I went down to Puerto Rico the first time, for example, about two weeks after Hurricane Maria hit, was that way we were driving to El Yunque, which is on the eastern part of the island where there's a big, big wireless tower that, and broadcast tower that serves the eastern part of the island. And I noticed as we went along, there was a, a cell tower where along the side of the road where there were a bunch of cars in the ditch just parked there. And I asked, uh, well, what's going on? And one of my coworkers said, who grew up in Puerto Rico, well, there's a rumor that went around that this tower has cell service. And so people are flocking here to try, try to tell some of the relatives on the mainland, look, I'm alive, I'm okay just to get in touch with them. And so that was one of the stories I told to FEMA because at the time we were fighting with a bunch of people who were sending barges to Puerto Rico with oil and food and healthcare supplies and the like. And we said, look, make sure you provide power generators for cell towers because that's one of the critical ways to stay in touch. So all of which is to say we spend a lot of time on some of that. And in addition to addressing the after effects, is there any kind of FCC acknowledgement that more of this is likely to be happening in the years Yeah, I mean, that's beyond our bailiwick, I guess you might say, uh, but we do, uh, we are focused on the resiliency and hardening of those networks. Uh -huh. So uh, just a couple of weeks ago, as a matter of fact, uh, the FCC approved my proposal to devote a billion dollars to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands to harden those networks because we understand that there are going to be many more storms coming. Those storms will be of more severe intensity. And so we want to make sure that if and when that happens, the fiber is buried in the ground and it's secure as opposed to what it was previously, aerial on utility poles and the like, where it can be destroyed very so quickly. The word climate change does enter your vocabulary. I have heard of the phrase, yes. <laughs> if that's what you're asking, yes. <laughs> hey. Hi, I'm Cap. I'm from San Francisco. Okay. Um, and I know this was not under the FCC's purview originally, but I'm wondering if you've come in contact with FOSTA SESTA. The Fix saying? Online Sex Trafficking Act. Oh, stuff. Foster, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and sort of how that's changed what you do and how you think about commercial sex work and the implications 
that it has for that? Yeah, so I haven't monitored it closely since it was adopted, so I know there's been some discussion about what the effects have been, and uh, there's, I remember reading an article expressing some concern that essentially this would have shifted uh, some of that work to a not as transparent platform, and so I, I haven't had a chance to, uh, to look at some of those issues. I will say in a previous life, I was a staffer on Capitol Hill where one of the things I worked on uh, was sex trafficking victims, and so the Trafficking Victim uh, Reauthor Protection Reauthorization Act was something I worked very closely on. And so uh, that is a cause close to my heart because I know there's a lot of women who are exploited in this country, so many of whom come from abroad. And uh, I, I do have a soft spot uh, for uh, any solutions to try to help them. Obviously, that, this is a bigger issue than, uh, than that. But um, uh, yeah, I, I can't speak with any uh, authority on uh, how, that is, how FOSTA's implementation has gone. Um, does the FCC have any, I guess, overlap with Russian hacking or Russian interference or Russian, I guess, interference in domestic issues like with net neutrality? Net. <laughs> no, we don't. That's a God's honest truth. Yeah, we don't. Um, I mean, other than li perhaps liaising with DHS on some of the threats uh, we see to domestic communications networks. So if, for example, there were either a state or non-state actor based in Russia that it might be uh, you know, sending traffic attacks and whatnot. Uh, yeah, we typically wouldn't get involved with that as much. Hi. Oh, sorry. Sorry. sorry yeah. I'll, I'll just back here. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Akshur, and I'm from Connecticut as well. Okay. So uh, where I'm from, AT&T is really the only option for broadband. And one of the concerns when net neutrality was repealed is that you know AT&T is with Directv. So relative to like other streaming services, right, that seems in inherently anti-competitive. So I understand that you know, if, if there were other competing broadband providers that this wouldn't be an issue. Right. And I know you touched upon reducing the barriers for access to new broadband providers, but is there anything the FCC is doing specifically to incentivize more broadband providers? And uh, also, what are your thoughts on municipal broadband? Yes, yeah, so for municipal broadband, uh, my position has always been very simple. It's up to the voters of a state to determine how to organize the laws of that state. And so if a state wants to permit localities uh, to uh, engage in municipal broadband projects, that is up to them. This is a federal system that we have. And so I have visited municipal broadband providers in places like Spencer, Iowa, uh, where they said, look, uh, and in the, the larger providers are just never going to provide access in our small town. So they just did it themselves. And so. Uh, similar thing in Ammon, Idaho, where I had a chance to see a fiber project that the government of Ammon has done. So it's really up to uh, the particular state. As to the first question, we recognize that there is a lack of competition in many areas. And so to us, at least, it was those two basic tools in the toolbox, modernizing the rules. So for example, with respect to AT&T, uh, one of the things we want to encourage is it, there's no cable company in your hometown. Is that right? Or? Uh, no. Yeah, so if it's a smaller cable company, uh, we've encouraged them through uh, some of the regulatory reforms we've done to enter the marketplace through OneTouch Make Ready, uh, through streamlining the process for getting a, an LFA agreement, a local, local franchise agreement. For the wireless companies, we've pushed a huge amount of spectrum into the marketplace to enable them to provide fixed wireless access and uh, mobile broadband as well. There are a lot of things that we're doing to promote more competition because we recognize there are a lot of folks uh, everywhere in the country who have one or even no choice for broadband. And that, that just isn't good enough for us either. Great, thank you. Hello, hey. uh, thank, uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Yeah, uh, So I'm Ivan, I'm from Honduras. Ah, I do research in wireless communications. Okay. And my question is, what do you think is the future of communication networks in general and wireless communications in specific? What are they going to look like in maybe like 30 years from now? Oh my God. So that's hard. Yeah, it's a tough, I mean, because it's changing so quickly now that I couldn't even forecast five years from now. I guess it really depends on uh, what the use cases of, are for 5G that might emerge. And so I can envision a future where uh, when we say wireless services, you won't even think of phones. You'll think more of IoT type applications. So if everybody had a sensor, for example, that always accompanied them, or uh, you know, your cars were not so much uh, mechanical devices, but internet connected devices that interacted with each other in real time. If healthcare was provided not so much by a doctor, but uh, using robots that did surgery and uh, actually came up with pharmaceutical prescriptions based on an algorithm tailored specifically to your makeup. I mean, those are the kinds of things I would imagine that wireless would look like in 30 years, if I had to guess. 
Um, some of it is, I mean, sort of scary sounding in a way, and I think there's a conversation about things like the future of work when we think about how wireless is going to be uh, eating everything that it is that we do. But um, I'm really excited to see some of the positive things that it could bring as well: greater efficiency, more productivity, uh, people able to do things they couldn't do before, especially uh, people who are on the wrong side of the digital divide currently. So, but especially, I mean, places like Honduras, I think it could be a game changer where if you can't find a business case for uh, laying fiber or building fixed infrastructure, uh, mobile broadband could be a way to leapfrog all of that. Uh, all of that, and we see that. In, I've seen that in some places, uh, you know, rural India, for example, where they can't provide it, fixed access, but wireless access is a great way to solve the problem. So hopefully, that's one way to close the digital divide around the world. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for a couple more here. Y quizás la próxima vez podemos hablar solamente en español. Hi. Hi, my name is Saket. I'm from Chandler, Arizona. Hi. Um, I was wondering, with, we've seen a lot of presidential candidates or Democratic presidential candidates right now talk about socializing healthcare with the idea that um, changing, I guess, the incentives of providing healthcare from profits to helping people live better lives um, would increase the efficiency, would like make healthcare more accessible for people in rural areas. What are your opinions on doing the same thing to broadband internet access, cell service, and that kind of thing? Again, with the idea that um, if the incentive of providing internet access was so people would have internet access instead of so companies would make profit, um, more people would have internet access and it would be like more efficient, more better. So I guess the, the basic problem, uh, what's the old aphorism that the only problem with free is that it costs too much? Uh, so in this, uh, the same thing when it comes to broadband. If you don't have a business case for building a broadband network, that broadband network will never exist. So I, I start with the elementary premise that the, the federal government, the FCC government generally, does not have sufficient funding to build broadband everywhere. So we have to rely on the private sector for the bulk of what, uh, what it is we want to do. So then the question becomes, well, what regulatory framework would be best calibrated to incentivize them to do that? And so to me, at least, the more heavily we regulate it, especially if we regulate it in terms of price, the harder it is to build a business case for deployment. And that's one of the things I do worry about. I understand, obviously, people complain my broadband bill is too high, or you know, the broadband provider doesn't have an incentive to come into my hometown, period. Those are things we're trying to tackle, but I think the worst thing that we could do for a type of uh, infrastructure like this, which requires very high upfront capital expenditures, very substantial operating expenditures over time to maintain and upgrade those networks, the worst thing we could do is to say, you know what, let's just make it free, or uh, the government will mandate how it's operated to make sure that it is at a low cost. Some countries have gone that, regions have gone that route. If you look at Europe, for example, their priority has been more or less price. They've very heavily regulated price. They have, generally speaking, uh, rules in some of these countries where if you build something, uh, you then have to uh, provide wholesale access to anybody else. And so it's almost as if if you spent the money and spent the time building a house, anyone could then live in, uh, in it at essentially your cost. And if you think about how that would affect your incentives going forward to build more houses, they would dramatically depress the incentives to build that infrastructure. And the same thing with broadband. Europe now has something like 50% or 60% less capex than the United States does. Some parts of Europe are still stuck on 3G, whereas we're racing towards 5G. Uh, they don't have the broadband infrastructure we do. And I would humbly submit that one reason is they have embraced more of the model of wouldn't be great if everything were cheap. And I understand, obviously, the you know, populist appeal to that, but it does come at a long-term cost. And so there's always that balance, obviously. We, we all want affordable services, especially something like broadband, which is so important. On the other hand, we also want that infrastructure to be upgraded over time. So there's got to be a happy medium that has to be struck there. So given that we've talked about some unproven threats to our national security, like uh, climate change or Russian election interference, I'm curious what you think about UFOs and particularly how UFOs Whoa. in space could, af could, affect, in hot. All right. could yeah. affect our ability to communicate with each other, given that we're operating in what could potentially be um, you know, alien territory. Um, I can with confidence say that of the many things I have thought about over the last two and a half years, that has not been one of them. So if there is, a, um, when we do think about not so much UFOs, but uh, as I said, orbital debris and uh, you know, if there are any objects out there that could cause uh, problems. So you know, NASA, for example, attracts a lot of the meteors and whatnot that come through. So that's the kind of thing that I, I, I do worry about. I haven't honestly thought about the UFO angle as much, I will confess. But if I should, if there's something out there that I'm not aware of, I, yeah, I'm always happy to be educated about it. Let's give a big thank you to Chairman Pai for coming. Oh, thanks.
Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. And I know there are a lot of questions in the back, so if you want to, you can always just email me directly. It's at jeet.py at fcc.gov. Or you can. Okay. Oh, no, no, yeah. Or you can find me on Twitter at jeetpyfcc. But no, really, as I mean it, I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, look forward to learning from you uh, in the time to come. So thanks. <laughs>